Well, good afternoon. My name is Abby Eames, Director of Education at the National World War II Museum, and I want to welcome you to our Lunchbox Lecture Program. Today's program is made possible by our sponsor, ARP Louisiana. Our presenter today is John McGunkin, and today's talk, he's going to be presenting on his uncle's service during World War II in a program titled, Sergeant Charles McGunkin, 22nd AFB, 4th Armored Division, A Citizen Soldier. So without further ado, I will turn this over to John. Good morning or afternoon. I'm John McGuckin. I want to thank you for well, all for tuning in to our presentation today and for your continuing interest in World War II. I'll start with a dedication. This is to all the soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen who answered the call to fight in World War II and who gave their lives in the Great Crusade lest we forget. My speech today is on Sergeant Charles Edward McGuckin, citizen soldier, uh, my uncle. Uh, the photographs are of my uncle, Brother McGuckin. He was known as Brother, and I'll use the uh, brother throughout the speech, except when he was in the war, uh, when he was deployed, uh, his uh, soldiers and crewmen in, in his armored vehicle called him McGuckin, Charlie, or Charles. Uh, a week from today, we celebrate Veterans Day. This holiday was originally Armistice Day to commemorate our war dead from World War I. Uh, my uncle was killed in action 76 years ago on November 11, 1944. This is to give you an idea of our military beginning of the war at the end of the war. The strength of our armed forces prior to 1940 was 334,473. The strength of the armed forces at the end of hostilities in 1945 was 12,209,238. Our armed forces volunteers were 4,737,000. 184. Armed Forces draftees, 7,472,054. The beginning of the war, our army was smaller than Portugal's army. This is the McGuckin family. Uh, that's uh, brothers' parents, Charles McGuckin and Margaret Doherty. They were married in 1912 in St. James Roman Catholic Church in Philadelphia. The center photo is Charles McGuckin, brother. He's on the right. His oldest brother, Jack McGuckin, my father, and a neighbor near the Market Street L station in the summer of 1920. And the final picture is brother and Jack McGuckin with their mother, Margaret, in the fall of 1924. Brother was born on March 9, 1915 in the center seat for Center City, Philadelphia. Charles McGuckin Sr. was employed as a welder and mechanic at Ford and Kendig, a manufacturer of automobile leaf springs. He helped build the Patterson Oil Terminals bunkering facility on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia and stayed on as a yard foreman. Patterson Oil provided fuel oil for the many ships using the Port of Philadelphia. The facility also provided diesel fuel, heating oil, and other related oils for use in the city's homes and factories. Margaret McGuckin was a homemaker and an excellent cook and mother to her two boys. The family moved to Southwest Philadelphia in 1918, buying a new house in the Most Blessed Sacrament Parish. The houses were built in rows of usually 10 houses. The new house on 53rd Street was three stories with a full cellar and four bedrooms. There were no supermarkets, and food and household items were bought at neighborhood grocery stores. Dairy products, milk, butter, and eggs were delivered by the milkman, driving a horse-drawn wagon. There was a butcher shop, grocery store, bakery, and barber shop within a block of the new house, two movie theaters, a hardware store, drug store, a library, and two saloons, which was necessary at the time, within four blocks. Some of these photos here, that's typical row houses, uh, upper left-hand picture. 
that's a grocery store. Uh, the grocery stores usually had a, a very good butcher. So you got good meat, you could get your cuts of meat. Street sports, really important. Uh, the children played football, basketball, and baseball in the street. There weren't as many cars back then, so it wasn't as exciting as when I was growing up playing in the street. But that's typical Philadelphia street ball. That's a milk, butter, and egg man. They would deliver your dairy products to your door, and uh, you would leave the empties on, the, on the, the stoop, and they'd pick them up. Trolley cars, those trolley cars might look familiar. Uh, one of the, the things I haven't been able to track down is that when Philadelphia got rid of their old trolley cars, they gave them to New Orleans. But that sure looks like the St. Charles trolley car. And that's a photo of a church dance. Neighborhood was a lot, very lively with lots of young children who played outside. Sports like baseball, basketball, and football were played at the street, in the street, and the nearby King's Essing Recreation Center. Soccer hadn't made it to the neighborhood yet. Transportation to downtown Philadelphia and the outlying areas was provided by a very efficient system of trolley cars. The local churches and civic organizations provided dances and other activities for the expanding population of Southwest Philadelphia. Most was a sacrament, church, and school. Uh, the upper left-hand photo shows one square city block of church, school, convent, and rectory, which serviced most of the sacrament parish in southwest Philadelphia. The church provided daily masses, religious holiday festivals, baptism, weddings, funerals, and overall moral guidance for the parishioners, as well as free grade school and high school for the children. MBS grade school, most of the sacrament grade school, was taught by Immaculate Heart of Mary nuns. You can see the upper, upper right-hand photo there. There's a Immaculate Heart of Mary nun hovering in the background there. Discipline was strictly enforced, strictly. The curriculum was very basic, stressing religion, reading, writing, arithmetic, American history, and geography. The girls wore uniforms, the boys wore shirt and tie. There was no misbehaving, and the pupils were focused on learning the basics. By the end of fourth grade, all the pupils could read, write, do basic math, and new U.S. history and rudimentary geography, as well as a Catholic religion. As a historical note, in 1950, MBS grade school was the largest elementary school in the United States. There were over 3,600 pupils, all taught in single classrooms by the nuns. First grade classes had between 90 and 100 pupils, some sitting three to a desk. Even with the large number of pupils, the standards for basic education remain the same. High school, West Catholic Boys High School. West Catholic Boys was founded in 1916 to provide a Catholic high school education to the young men of the growing Catholic parishes of West Philadelphia. A four-year curriculum taught by Christian brothers prepared the students for the priesthood, college, or jobs in the Philadelphia area industrial sector. That's a photo of the school right there, West Catholic Boys. Now about five blocks away, there was West Catholic girls. They, that time they didn't believe in mixing people and the boys and girls in the same classroom. In World War II, the young men of West Catholic answered the call with approximately 18,000 graduates serving during the war. 153 Burrs were killed in action and approximately another 350 were wounded. Burrs is the nickname of the, the high school. The sports teams were called the Burrs. If you went to West Catholic, you were a Burr. It was named after the Burrs on the chestnut trees on Chestnut Street in front of the school. Charles Edward McGuckin, class of 1933, was among those killed in action. Great Depression in 1929. The Great Depression hit the United States. There's widespread unemployment with thousands of workers on the street looking for work and standing in bread lines. The McGuckin family was no stranger to these hard times. Pop McGuckin, Charles McGuckin, he was affectionately called Pop, worked as a specialty contract welder on various heavy construction projects throughout the country with Brother McGuckin and his older brother Jack working at odd jobs whenever they could, whenever they could find work 
to help support the family. Brother did day work in construction and worked part-time as a gauger at the Patterson Oil Terminal with his father, Charles, senior, after Pop began working there full-time. In 1936, the country began to rearm and new construction vessels for expanding Navy were started at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Brother McGuckin was able to get a job as a pipe fitter helper working on these vessels. The photographs is a typical bread line. These guys are waiting in, in line to get some soup and some bread. Day labor jobs, digging ditches. Uh, our people were really good at doing that. Heavy manufacturing, every now and again you could find a job if somebody was, was uh, building a locomotive or, or doing some heavy, uh, heavy construction work. Construction for houses and buildings would hire day laborers. Naval Shipyard, that's the USS Washington under construction in the late, construction in the late 30s. Uh, this was a, kind of a boon to the area because they started hiring people. These are naval pipe fitters that worked in the next picture. Uh, you can see it's out, outside work. And they're working on the inner bottom of a ship, of a ship putting the pipes in. Trip to Honduras, 1936. How does a guy from Southwest Philadelphia wind up in Honduras dressed up in riding clothes? In 1919, brother's aunt, Jeanette, married the son of the president of Honduras, uh, Harvey Roman Bogran. He was the uh, finishing, high, finishing uh, college medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. He became the chief medical officer for the United Fruit Company. Uh, in 1936, in September 36, uh, brother took a trip to Honduras uh, to visit with his family and to ins inspect the banana plantations and the lumber mills. Uh, apparently, he rode some horses when he was down there. Uh, he went on the SS Musa, which was a United Fruit Company, uh, a banana boat. It was a refrigerated cargo carrier. Uh, going from Honduras to ports of the United States. Uh, about after, there about, after being there about two months, he returned to the United States with his two young cousins, Betty, 16, and Peggy, 14, and they remained in Philadelphia to attend school and to learn English. It's a call to the colors. The Selective Service Act of 1940 Franklin Roosevelt signed this act as passed through Congress. It was the first peacetime draft in the United States. All men, 21 to 35, required to register. Later it was changed after we get into the war, 18 to 65, and men with families. Required men picked for duty to serve for 12 months and service the United States in its possessions. After Pearl Harbor, the term of service was extended for the duration and you could serve anywhere in the world. And this is home leave from Camp Forest, Tennessee in 1942. U.S. Armored Divisions. As I said before, uh, brother joined the 22nd Field Artillery Battalion, which was part of uh, the 4th Armored Division. Drawing from German Panzer Division's model, the U.S. Armored Divisions were a true combined arms unit using tanks, mobile field artillery and armored infantry to provide a heavy-hitting mobile force designed to spearhead attacks. The early U.S. Armored Divisions were first formed in 1940 and evolved through various organizational models prior to seeing action in North Africa in 1942. The 4th Armored Division, April 15, 1941. The division The division is officially established at Pine Camp, New York, established in 1909. Pine Camp is still there, it's now Camp Drum. May of 1941, division strength reached 10,000. Training continues at Pine Camp, New York. In January of 1942, the 4th Armory was moved to Camp Forest, Tennessee. First Corps, Tennessee maneuvers. In November of 42, the 4th Armored was moved to Camp Ibis, the California Desert Training Center. The center was commanded by Major General George Patton, who we'll hear of later. They lived in tents. It was very hot. They got a gallon of water a man a day and eight field rations. It was kind of rough living. 
22nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion. It's one of the uh, original comp components of the 4th Armored Division. The battalion participated in all the previous movements of the division. The 22nd was originally equipped with a 105 millimeter howitzer M101. This was a 5,000 pound field piece that was towed by the two and a half ton truck, six by, which carried the seven man crew and ammunition. This weapon was retained throughout training at Pine Camp and was released by, replaced by the M7 105 millimeter motor gun carriage at the California Desert, Desert Training Center in 1943. Desert Training Center. These photographs show some, some photos at the Desert Training Center of Brother and his crew. That's the M101 howitzer at Pine Camp, New York winter. And then they moved to the Desert Training Center in the summer of 42. A little difference in the snow on the ground and they got sand on the ground in the desert. That's a photograph of one of the original prototypes of the test model at Pine Camp, New York, winter 1941-42. And this is brother and his gun, the motor gun carriage at the training center, center in California, the summer of 42. So sometime between the picture in the upper right and the picture in the lower right, they switched from the towed gun carriage, the towed uh, artillery piece to the motor gun carriage. Now you have to excuse me for getting technical here, but I have some members of the audience are interested in this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna read the technical uh, description of the M7 motor carriage. It was first produced in 1942 using the M3 Grant medium tank chassis. In other words, you took a Grant tank and cut the turret off it. The two prototypes were bought, built at Baldwin Lima Hamilton, Philadelphia. As a historical note, my wife's father, Frank Mullen, was a tool and dime maker foreman at Baldwin Lima Hamilton when these prototypes were built. He might have actually worked on them. Original model was soon replaced by one using the M4 Sherman chassis. Motor power is provided by a Continental 9-cylinder rotary gas engine rated at 350 horsepower. One of the problems with this engine was that if it was allowed to idle for any period of time, the spark plugs would become fouled, the engine would run rough. This problem was solved in the field with portable sandblasting machines, which were used to keep a spare set of spark plugs ready to go. Uh, when I was in high school, my best friend worked at a garage, and the garage was owned by Mr. Al. Mr. Al was a, a veteran from one of the armored divisions, I don't know which one, but he was a, a sergeant in charge of maintenance. And at the end of the war, apparently, the Army didn't need some of these sandblasting machines because Al had three of them, and he kept a big pile of spark plugs that he would sandblast and then sell to people as new spark plugs. Just a little historical note. The range of the M7 was 85 miles at 15 miles an hour. It needs a lot of gas. The M7 had a crew of seven men. The mounted 100, uh, M101 155 millimeter howitzer had a range of 12,000 yards or 6.8 miles. The howitzer was, if you look at the howitzer in that picture, it, it was the same wheeled cannon that they took the wheels off and they welded it inside the motor gun carriage. It fired fixed ammunition, one piece, that was available in high explosive, smoke, or white phosphorus. Original combat load was 69 rounds of 105 and up to 1,000 rounds of 50 caliber for the mounted M2HB, which our military still uses, great gun. A full complement of M1 rifles, Thompson submachine guns were also carried. Overseas deployment. June of 1943, the battalion moved to Camp Bowie, Texas, August 22, 1943. Sergeant McGuckin was granted his last stateside leave to stand as godfather for his nephew, John Charles McGuckin. He called John Charles McGuckin, Johnny Doughboy. That's me, and that's me in the dress. My uncle's holding me there at the christening. December 11, 1943, they moved to Camp Miles Standish, Boston, Port of Embarkation. December 29, 1943, sailed from Port of Boston to Cardiff, Wales, United Kingdom, 
on board the SS Thomas H. Barry. That's a photograph of the Thomas Barry carrying troops to Europe. January 9th, 1944, they arrived in Wales, proceeded to Wiltshire, England for training on Salisbury Plain. January to July 44, training in England. The English military and civilians were generally glad to see our troops with some friction caused by the much higher pay rate of our troops versus the British, among other things. Training in England was very rigorous and demanding. The battery was housed in barracks, no heat except a little uh, coal-fired stove to heat the whole barracks, if they had coal. They ate basic army field rations prepared by their own cooks. Food rationing was tight in England, but our troops ate better than the locals. And there was a lot of trading going back and forth. We would trade our food for other things. There was opportunity for sightseeing and interacting with the local civilians, except the beer was warm. This was a very big hardship that the soldiers had to overcome. This is a photograph on the lower right-hand corner of a cup, a silver cup, that was sent to me from England by my uncle. And it reads on the cup, to Johnny Doughboy from Uncle Charlie, England, 1944. I received a cup, or my family received it. I was a little bit too, too young to do other things than bite the handle off it. Received in 1944, May of 44. The 4th Armored Division and the 22nd toughened up and got ready for the war, which was just across the channel. At this time, the 4th Armored Division had 10,937 men mustered for action. Some of these photographs, that's an actual meet and greet with some British troops. The training, the two photos on training show them, uh, people taking their tanks apart, our soldiers learning to replace the guns and engines and whatever, and also for using a self-propelled bridging equipment to cross ditches. This is uh, some of our soldiers sightseeing at Stonehenge, which uh, if you ever get to England, that's interesting to go see. And this is serious training right here in a British pub. It looks like our guys by that time had learned to drink their warm beer because they're, they're smiling. And that's a picture of my cup, which I still have. The battalion goes to war. All dates and locations are taken from the unit diary of the 22nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion, which was sent to me by Tech Corporal, Tech Corporal Len Waldman, along with a letter about Sergeant McGuckin. Waldman was attached to the headquarters battery of the 22nd during the war. Back in the late 80s, I was doing genealogical research, and I wrote away to the uh, Fourth Armored Division Association, and I got a lot of first-person first letters as, long, as well as the field diary, which is really interesting. July 13, 1944, the battalion was mobilized and traveled to Normandy on LSTs, landing on Utah Beach. The 4th Armored Division was assigned to Major General Patton's 3rd Army. There's General Patton again. July 14th through the 28th. The time between these dates was spent being blooded under General Bradley's direct order. They had the 4th uh, Armored Division running around, getting in fights with the Germans and uh, getting blooded. July 28, 1944, the Third Army became an operational organization. When the Third Army became operational, they broke loose and embarked on one of the most spectacular campaigns in the history of warfare. Breakout, July 28 to July 31, 1944. The Fourth Armored Division led Patton's Third Army breakout from the stalemate at Operation Battlefield as a final part of Operation Cobra. American forces had been stopped by a tenacious German defense and the Normandy hedge rows. This is from uh, June 6th to July 28th. Uh, we were more or less contained and uh, trying to break out. We finally broke out on the 28th. July 28th, July 31st, the battalion passed through Cautance, Ver, Beauchamp, and Avranche. They fired in support of advancing tank and armored infantry formations learning to use air assets and forward observers to register artillery concentrations. The battalion received its first casualties, killed in action three, wounded in action one. Distance covered 44 miles. On the lower right is an actual picture I was able to find during my research of the uh, 
22nd Field Artil Artillery Battalion, uh, Battery B, showing my uncle. That's him standing up there on the right. Corporal Alford in the middle and First Sergeant Lezinski. I was able to identify my uncle from the sergeant stripes. I blew the picture way up. And sergeant stripes, glasses, and the wad of tobacco that he was chewing. Pursuit, August 1st, August 31st, 1944. <coughs> Excuse me. Starting in Avranche on July 31st, the Third Army attacked southwest as far as Hedecourt. They then turned east and fought their way through Troyes on August 28th. The distance covered 790 miles, three killed in action for 790 miles of combat. Seven wounded in action, 442 prisoners. No idea of the enemy casualties. With the 4th Armored Division spearheading, 3rd Army overran German 7th Army and associated formations. SS Panzer Divisions, regular Wehrmacht units, prior troops, and the remnants of the forces defending Normandy. The battalion was halted briefly, turned 180 degrees in order to attack west on the Brittany Peninsula. They were again turned 180 degrees on August 7th at Hennebont and again attacked east, fighting through Provence and Angier, approaching Mavet on August 17th. The 4th Armored Division was not stopped at Thalais Gap, Debacle. They were on the right flank of Patton's 3rd Army and continued to advance <clears throat> while thousands of German troops, along with most of the staffs of the defeated German formations, were allowed to escape at Thalais. They reached Orléans on August 20th and continued the advance east, crossing the Marne at Chevillon on August 31st. Even though the Third Army was repeatedly stopped and slowed down by higher command rationing their gas and other supplies, Patton ma managed to continue the offensive. Again, 790 miles covered in a month. This is August 1st to August 31st, 1944. The Third Army was constantly starved for ammunition, food, and especially fuel during this advance. There was a tendency from higher headquarters, Bradley and Eisenhower, to divert supplies to Montgomery, who was slowly advancing, very slowly, to the north. At the same time, General Lee, not Robert E. Lee, this is World War II General Lee, was the head of the U.S. Quartermaster Corps in Europe, he used large amounts of gasoline and other supplies to move his enormous staff to Paris, where they continued to use supplies that were desperately needed by the advancing Allied frontier armies. The Third Army continued the rapid advance by finding fuel and other supplies meant for the American First Army. Third Army quartermasters converted kitchen trunks to carry gas, diverted First Army gas trucks to their own depots, lived on sea rations, Farage food and captured German supplies. Every time the Germans regrouped and tried to counterattack, they were run over by Third Army tanks and smothered by artillery. The Third Army was finally stopped out of gas on September 1st at Chalais. They were able to restart a limited offensive on September 5th through September 25th, where they were stopped at Aracor. During the stops between September 2nd and 10th, the battalion received hot chow mail, and a visit by Red Cross clubmobiles. During this uh, advance across France, uh, they weren't able to eat properly. They just ate field rations, and uh, they didn't have the uh, uh, mail and other resources. Once they were stopped, things caught up with them. September 2nd, 1940, September 1st to October 31st, 1944. September 2nd, stop to Chalains, little gas, ammunition, or supplies. September 5th, they received the first Red Cross Clubmobile services, mail, rations, some gas, ammunition, and movies. Uh, the bottom picture there is a Red Cross Clubmobile that had donuts and coffee. And there's the middle picture is uh, the crew standing, sitting around eating field rations, probably uh, K rations or B rations. 
and the much uh, needed looked forward to mail call at the top. September 6th to the 10th, 1944, remained in position at Chalet. September 10th to 20th, attacked east through Contensee, Lonneville, Menacourt, Hauteville, Haricourt, and Chateau Salons. September 20th to the 24th, stopped again. Remained in position at Chateau Salons. They replaced, repulsed heavy German infantry and armored counterattacks. Moved to Aracourt. This is a typical Germans. Whenever they weren't pressed real hard, the German army would always counterattack. This was the first counterattack in a month because they were, the 4th Armored was stopped. September 26th through October 31st, they remain, remain in position at Aracor, all gas and other supplies diverted to Operation Market Garden. Distance covered 90 miles, killed in action 5, wounded in action 24, no prisoners. Stop, September 1st, October 31st, 1944. This shows the 90-some uh, miles that they covered uh, to Chevillon, where they were stopped, and again moving on to Avranche. Third Army's advance was stopped on September 1st at Chalains and continued until September 26th at Aracor, with many stops and slowdowns due to the lack of essential supplies, <clears throat> mostly gasoline. General Montgomery's Operation Market Garden was given priority for supplies at the expense of the American Third and First Armies. Montgomery's very complicated plan to attack north through Holland across the Rhine into Germany using paratroopers to secure the nine bridges on the 64 miles, 64 miles from the start of the offensive to its final target at Arnhem was doomed to failure due to poor planning, bad intelligence, the presence of two SS Panzer divisions who were sitting right in the middle of the drop zones, and overall slowness of the British 30th Corps. Operation Margaret Garden ran from September 17th to the 25th, but supplies for the 3rd Army started to be diverted early in September, were not resumed until the middle of October. Operation Market Garden was a complete disaster costing the Allies over 17,000 casualties and essentially destroying the British 1st Airborne Division and the Polish 1st Independent Parachute Brigade. The American 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions were also decimated. The 3rd Army's supply problem continued until the middle of October with the 4th Armored Division sitting idle at Aracor for five weeks while the Germans were able to resupply, reorganize, and fortify around Nancy and Metz. At the time, by the time the offensive was resumed on November 9th, the weather had severely deteriorated. The Germans were well dug in and made the Thir Third Army pay for any advance. November 9th and November 30th, 1944. November 2nd to the 8th, they remained in position near Aracor, no gas, low on ammunition or food, heavy rains, fog, overall bad weather, Limited mobility. November 9th, they began the SAR campaign. They attacked east through Vivier to Hill 260. November 10th to the 12th, out of gas, heavy fighting in Vivier, repulsed German counterattacks. Distance covered 30 miles. As a historical note here, that's uh, uh, German Panzer Grenadiers leaving their armored car on the attack. They were pretty good troops. They were armored infantry who traveled uh, to battle and got out and fought, got out of their armored cars and fought. Uh, they didn't have any tanks, but they uh, used half tracks and they had self -propelled, very good self-propelled guns. They were pretty good troops. Uh, the top is the M7 in battery in the snow. Vivier, November 11, 1944. And that's a real good map showing Hill 260 and the woods to the right of Hill 260. After fighting its way through Vivier, the battalion was dug in on Hill 260, approximately one mile north of Vivier. 
After a day-long artillery duel with the German 401st Volks Artillery Corps, the German 110th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, supported by assault guns and heavy mortars, counterattacked during the night, recapturing Villiers, and effectively cut off the, cut off the 22nd. November 11, 1944. Out of gas, short on ammunition and food, the men of the battalion were out of their vehicles, dug in and fighting with small arms. Sergeant McGuckin was killed in action by a mortar burst while rescuing Corporal Alford, a wounded crew member. Alford was wounded three times but survived, losing his left arm. Sergeant McGuckin was awarded a posthumous Silver Star and Purple Heart for this action. The battalion suffered four men killed and 20 men wounded in action on November 11th. This is the highest casualty count the battalion suffered during the war. The war comes home. This is the actual telegram that my grandmother received in the lower right-hand corner, and I'll read. Washington, D.C., 29 November 1944, Mrs. Margaret McGuckin, 1540 South 53rd Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that your son, Sergeant Charles E. McGuckin, was killed in action. On 11 November in France, a letter follows. Witzel acting for the Adjutant General. The Gold Star Banner in the upper right. Families having relatives in service during World War II displayed a white banner in their window. Banner showed a blue star for every service member and switched to a gold star if that service member was killed in action. The McGuckin family switched from two blue stars to one blue star and one gold star after receiving his telegram. The blue star was from my father who was serving in the Mediterranean aboard an LST. These are first pe uh, person testimonials. The first one is from Corporal Alford, written to Charles's mother, Margaret McGuckin, in September of 1945. Corporal Alford was a wounded member of Sergeant McGuckin's M7 crew who lost his left arm from a mortar burst while Sergeant McGuckin was trying to evacuate him when he was killed. Corporal Clarence to Mrs. Margaret McGuckin, September 1945. I owe you more than anyone in the world, for Charlie died helping me to medical aid. It is very hard for me to write the details of it, for it happened all so fast. It seemed like a few minutes. Charlie didn't live but a short while after he was hit. He was conscious for a while. His last words were, they got me Alf, which he always called me. He knew what had hit him. I don't believe that anyone in the battery could be missed more than Charlie was. The next is a letter that I received from First Sergeant Lezinski in 1982 when I was doing family research. And that's a photo of First Sergeant Lezinski, and that's a photo of Corporal Alfred there in the top. This is a little bit long. Charles and I were buddies from the start, both from Philly. We drank together, attended church together, took leave together, and darn near died together. Charles died in my arms. McGuckin, as we called him, was a gem of a person I'm sure he didn't have an enemy in the world. He died in the Saar mud. The cold winter rain had been flowing for about three weeks, and the Lorraine pastures and countryside were bogs. There was no way to dig a foxhole or a trench. It would fill up with water. The mud and blood were the chief ingredients of the Saar campaign. We started the winter offensive the morning of 9 November. We had quite a fight in our hands, and we paid dearly for every mile we gained. On November 10th, we captured Vivier, a small village with just one road through it. We moved through the town to a hill about one mile north of the village and camped for the night. The next morning, right in front of our position, we spotted a full German infantry company in single file prepared for battle, marching toward a heavy wooded area. These jokers were carrying mortars and heavy machine guns. We had them in the open. We could have wiped them out but we had orders not to fire on them because our brass figured they were going to surrender. They didn't surrender, and they made it to the cover of the woods before we opened fire on them. And John, we paid dearly for this one mistake. They took pot shots at us with the heavy mortars, and they were very accurate. We lost several vehicles and quite a few men. This is where McGuckin was hit. Corporal Alfred lost his arm. McGuckin was trying to stop the bleeding. The Germans were peppering the area. Finally, Charles was hit full blast in the stomach area. Several of us crawled through the mud to where he and Alfred were laying, 
I picked Charles's head out of the mud, and John, you can believe me, he died in my arms. I believe McGuckin lived his hell on earth, and now he's at the right hand of God. Some more first-person uh, testimonials. That's tech corp Techno Corporal Abe Cohen, also from Philadelphia. I was a member of your uncle's Battery B. We were friends by contact in that outfit. He was among several who had come from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area, as I was. McGuckin, as we were known to each other by our last names, was a very warm, amiable, well-liked young man. He was killed in action in one of the areas where we would receive more casualties than any other. We dished out lots more than we received, so it was really an unusual situation for those few days. Our division was reputedly surrounded for several days. We were pounded by enemy tanks on a hill in front of us. We were originally supposed to be both artillery and anti-tank, but our howitzers were not very good anti-tank weapons. That's a very good reason why he was hit that day. He had told me many times that he thought the war would be over by Memorial Day. That's a very valid reason to remember the day he was hit. The war was over for him on Veterans Day. I don't know yet if there's such a thing as a hero in a war, but I think your uncle would be put in such a category. The next is from uh, Tech Corporal Len Wallman, a 1982 letter. Uh, Corporal Wallman is the one that sent me the field diary. I was a member of Battery B throughout the war years, although I was attached to headquarters battery during combat. From a personal point of view, I knew your uncle from Pine Camp, New York days, and through our basic training in Texas, California, and Tennessee. I can honestly recall that Charlie was a good friend, a good soldier, and a tribute to your family. I also recall that if you saw someone smoking a good cigar, that person had to be Charlie. <clears throat> this is a letter that my uh, grandmother, Margaret, received uh, from Lieutenant Colonel Patterson, Peterson, the commanding officer of the 22nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion. Charles had served with us for three years and six months. In losing him, we feel that we have not only lost an excellent soldier and man, but also a friend who can never be, who can never be replaced. Charles was buried in an army cemetery in eastern France. A U.S. Army chaplain of the Catholic faith presided at the burial ceremony. That's uh, Colonel Peterson's picture, and this is a, a field ceremony in France. Uh, lots and lots of crosses with the Catholic chaplain reading a service uh, for that particular fallen soldier. Return to the States. The return to the war dead, of the war dead to the States began in early 1947. At the request of the family, Sergeant McGuckin was returned to Philadelphia in September of 1948. He was buried in a family plot at Holy Cross Cemetery on September 14, 1948. <clears throat> That's the family plot there, the Dockerty name, because my uh, grandmother and grandfathers, their mothers and mother and fathers were buried uh, in that plot. The local American Legion post provided the graveside ceremony and military honors. I was five years old, but I still remember the ceremony particularly the part where I got in trouble for running out to collect the empty cartridge cases from the three volley salute. My father hit me in the head. These are family and friends who served in return. Uh, my family contributed, my immediate family contributed to the war. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, my father, Jack McGuckin, third class electrician on the LST 526 served in, a, in action in the Mediterranean. Uh, he was a foreman at Fleischmann Baking, Bakery Company after the war. He passed away when I was 14. He was a good man, Boy Scout leader, uh, all around good guy, and I still miss him. Next picture is George Newman, along with Joseph Newman. Uh, these are my mother's uh, two brothers, the next two. He was a uh, metalsmith third on the USS Holland, a submarine tender, AS-4, in the South Pacific. After the war, he was a chief welding instructor at Gulf Oil Company in Philadelphia. 
Uh, I worked in the shipyard after high school, Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, and one of my jobs, I drilled a lot of holes. George gave me a lot of advice on uh, steel construction. I particularly remember I had a lot of trouble, we all did, drilling holes in stainless steel. And George told me that they learned during the war, because the submarines that they were working on had lots of stainless steel, to use condensed milk as a, a cutting lubricant for stainless steel, drilling stainless steel. I remember that. Uh, George is uh, 16 years old then. He lied about his age. Standing next to him is Joseph Newman. And the final picture is Joseph Newman, Chief Motor Machinist Mate, U.S. Coast Guard, LST, in the South Pacific. Uh, after the war, he wound up as a deputy chief of the Philadelphia Fire Department. He taught me to fit, hunt, shoot, fish, how to do basic uh, construction, uh, how to run copper tubing, basic electrical. Uh, he really looked after me. All my uncles looked after me after my father passed away, but especially Uncle Joe. Next picture is Joseph McKenna, and he's in his uh, deputy chief suit there. He was an aviation machinist, May 3rd, uh, United States Navy, New Caledonia. Uh, after the war, he wound up as the deputy commissioner of the Philadelphia Fire Department. Next one is Joseph O'Neill. Joseph O'Neill was a sergeant in the 53rd Armored Engineer Battalion, the 8th Armored Division, European Theater of Operations. He got into the war after the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, he was an uh, uh, armored engineer. They would drive around in uh, armored vehicles and uh, half-tracks and build bridges, uh, blow up stuff that needed blowing up, and they would clear minefields. He was severely wounded in February of 1945 uh, while he was out clearing a minefield with a, a bayonet. Uh, he received a Silver Star and a Purple Heart for this action. After the war, he advanced to the commissioner of the Philadelphia Police Department. At one time, Joseph O'Neill, Joseph McKenna, and Joseph Newman were all in the Philadelphia Fire Department as Commissioner, Philadelphia Fire Department and Police Department as Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, and Fire Chief. The last picture is Dutch Preger, my friend. Motor machinist made second class, USS Kingfish, SS 234. Four war patrols in the Pacific, President, uh, Chief, Chief uh, Executive Officer, Preger Gear in New Orleans. If you look across the street from the, uh, the museum, the parking garage and hotel is built on the property that used to be occupied by Prager Gear. Prager Gear Dutch was a third generation. Uh, when he took over, when he, when he was the CEO, when I first moved to New Orleans, uh, Prager Gear was the number one machine shop and gear manufacturing in the, uh, facility in the Gulf South. Uh, Prager, Dutch is uh, probably about 19, 20 years old in that picture. A lot of his memorabilia is here in the uh, museum, and uh, he's given several speeches like this, uh, lunchbox lectures in the museum. Sergeant Charles Edward Brother McGuckin, U.S. Army, 22nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion, 4th Armored Division, killed in action, France, November 11, 1944. And I'll quote a poem first verse of the poem, For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion, written in 1914. They went with songs of the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady in a glow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow, grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, so one of the questions is uh, about your research. So how you went about researching uh, your uncle's service. Uh, so what are some of the, you know, the tools that you used in order to dive deeper into you know, collecting his story? Most of my uh, research was done on, uh, first off, uh, family oral history. I, I grew up in the, the same house that he lived in. And uh, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother, 
that picture was hanging on the wall along with his uh, citations, and it was a uh, subject that was discussed. Uh, later on, when I became uh, interested in genealogy, my mother was a great source of information. Also, the uh, various publications, uh, various books on General Patton, uh, the actual field diary from the 22nd Field Artillery Battalion, which I had in my possession, and uh, just general uh, information on the war. Excellent. Um, another question is, um, have you had a chance to actually uh, go abroad and see some of the places where, you know, your uncle served? No, except in, uh, in France. Uh, on a trip, trip to France, uh, we did visit, uh, of course, Normandy, where he came ashore. Visit, he came ashore at uh, Utah, Utah Beach in Normandy. And we did visit uh, Caltas, where that picture was taken, and uh, passed through the route of the uh, Second Armor Division, uh, the Fourth Armor Division, at uh, Orléans and uh, Chart. We made it to Chart, but the uh, Texas, California, Pine Camp, I haven't visited them. Okay. All right, and I think. That might be all of our questions for today. So uh, thank you, John, so much uh, for speaking with us today and sharing uh, your uncle's story, your family's uh, World War II story. And uh, thank you again also for AARP uh, Louisiana for being our sponsor. Uh, please join us next month, uh, well, actually this month, on November 18th for a talk by uh, Dr. Kristen Burton, who will be discussing vices uh, such as drug and alcohol use during World War II. So we hope to see you again very soon. Check out all of our programs on our website, which is nationalww2museum.org. Thank you all again for joining us.